Hey, what's up? Welcome back to the Musicians Talk Show, episode four. As always, I'm Dallas Dwight. And I'm Matt Tolley. Yeah, man. Uh, I mean, we have a killer episode today, Yeah, right? yeah, really awesome. I mean, who do we have today? We have is it Kelly. Prince? It's not Prince. Damn it. <laughs> Prince is in the episode, There's though. a Prince reference, though. <laughs> Prince is with us in spirit. Who do we have, Matt Tolley? Kelly Lemieux. Kelly Lemieux. Man, I cannot say enough good things about this guy. Phenomenal bass player. Uh, just... The projects he's been a part of are oh, just awesome. So Some many, my, so many great projects. You were saying, you were saying, you know, you, you said something along the lines of, "I don't really know Kelly's bass playing, but everything he's been a part of, right. I love." Right. So that's got to say something. It does. Right? It does. I mean, Goldfinger, Buck Cherry, Paul Gilbert, one of my favorites. Yeah. MD Forty Five. Yeah. Uh, Dave, Electric Love Hogs with Dave Kushner way back in the day. Yep. Kushner. Yep. Sorry. Um, just everything. All kinds. So of many good great things. things. Con- consummate Road Dog. Always on the road. Yep. He, he's got so many great stories, so many great insights, yeah. and I think you guys are really going to love this episode, so let's not yap anymore. Let's get in it. Here we go. I wanted to start with, what are you up to lately? I haven't talked to you in a while. Um, let's see. Mm, did some, uh, we did some buck cherry fly dates, doing that here and there. Um, I have some local projects I'm doing in Portland, Oregon, where I live. Yeah, you had a gig I, last week. How'd that go? Um, oh, it was killer. It nice. was fucking, dude, so much fun. So much fun. It's just like rock cover tunes. And then that's Trans Am Summer. And then I have, um, um, it's just like a conglomeration coalition of my buddies. Uh-huh. Some of them are transplants that I didn't know in California. Cause there's a lot of musicians moving up here right now. And some you're, of you probably here in Portland, right? Yeah. 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 Yeah, exactly. That's awesome. yeah. So I grew up in Salem, just South of here. Okay. Um, I did all my, uh, we would call my pubescent years. And, and then I moved to Los Angeles, a uh, couple of years out of high school and was down there forever. And then, you know, my brother and sister live up here and I got a bunch of friends that, live around here and in the Portland area. So I got you. Um, I just made my way back up here cause, um, LA is just kind of crowded right now. <laughs> what do you mean by that? I mean, do you just mean there's uh, a lot, of people, a lot of people there? I got you. There's a lot, a lot of people. I got tired of just people on top of people. Yeah. You, you don't mean in the I sense mean, that I it's... love LA. Don't get me wrong, but there's just, just the traffic's insane. And yeah. a lot of people are moving out of there and coming up here. So I imagine the next couple of years, it'll get even worse than it has. Yeah. <laughs> do, do, even you mean, this place, do you yeah, mean it's, it's like saturated with too many musicians? Oh, yeah. oh yeah. well, no, I like lots of musicians. That doesn't bother me. I'm gotcha. all for all the musicians coming up. I got gotcha. you. Cause that's just, you know, it's just, I mean, just people and the cost of living and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Quality of life. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm really into quality of life. Yeah. I saw uh, an article one time, a long time ago, that Portland is the best city for your skin. So, congrats. Oh, really? I didn't know that. That's good to know. (laughs) It must be something to do with the the wetness or the the rain and Uh, stuff. I think so. The annual uh, rainfall has probably got a lot to do with it. And it's it's also not good if you're into, like, mold and stuff because it gets so damp and wet here that... yeah. You know, shit starts smelling musty. <laughs> That's always fun. Like the sh- a lot of shut-ins here because of the weather. I-, I try to exercise and I take vitamins and, uh, you know, there's definitely seasonal depression going on. So, but anyways, yeah, as far as what I've been up to, I've been doing that. Um, yeah, just playing a lot with those and I'm actually opening... My new band's opening, my Trans Am Summer's opening for the DCs, which is my ACDC band. I was just about to ask you what what was going on with the DCs. I, I assumed it was a was an ACDC tribute because I've seen some of the videos Oh, yeah, and stuff. yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what's going on with that? Um, Playing next weekend, just booking shows. For, you know, we're just kind of doing it for fun, and it's kind of just, you know, we did it because I got a singer that can handle all that I stuff. I was about it's, to say the singer is killer. <laughs> Well, that's kind of why I just went, he, he, um, that's actually, a, um, my buddy, Stephen McSwain and he's actually, um, he's a guitar builder and he moved up here also from Los Angeles. Um, he's originally from, I think he's from North Carolina. I think he's from Charlotte. Originally. Hey, that's where we are. 
Yeah, so I think that's where he's from originally. You should check his guitars out, McSwain guitars. McSwain um, guitars. I'll make a note right now. Yeah, um, and he's he moved into the neighborhood, and I, I always post as a joke, but not really. Um, Auto Sausage Kitchen. I don't know if you ever see my post where I'm located, and they're actually my landlords slash like neighbors. They're twenty feet away. Uh huh. We're it's, they're the business on the corner, and then we're the house like right next to it. And they own like a couple of the houses on the street. They've been there forever. It's a it's a uh, it's a meat institution in Portland here in the Woodstock area. Okay. So, anyways, um, he just goes, "Hey, uh, I see you're like, do you live like in Portland? Because you always put Auto Sausage Kitchen." And I'm like, "Yeah, I'm right next door." And he's like. Dude, I live like 12 blocks away from you. So next thing I know, I went and checked out his uh, guitars. And then I saw from the NAMM show a couple of years ago, he went up and sang some ACDC songs. And I was like, dude, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> so one thing led to another. And I got some other buddies that are good players and that I like to hang out with. And um, our other buddy, uh, Doug Rappaport, who plays with the Edgar Winter Group, Doug lives in a city kind of, you know, he's about 40 minutes away Okay. Um, in McMinnville and he just moved here. And I, I found out about him through my guitar tech, Dave Pate from Buck Cherry and Dave, uh, Dave was Joe Bonamassa's tech forever. And I think Edgar Winter Group did a bunch of shows and Doug's another LA transplant. And like this all happened all at the same time. And I'm like, yeah. it's fake. Yeah. Let's yeah. play some ACDC. Yeah. That's so the we, only thing I'm do. getting out of that story is like what a small world it is. Yeah, it really was. And I had just gotten out of the hospital. I was, I was in the hospital in 2000, most of 2016 for, or at least half of the year I was, you know, got sick and, and spent a shitload of time in the hospital. And, and, uh, um, I actually hit Doug up on one of my, I, I was out for a little bit. I had to go in and do these stupid chemo treatments and um, basically just hit Doug up. You know, my buddy was like, yeah, Doug just moved there, man. Hit him up. So we actually got in contact during that time because I couldn't go out and tour and anything. And I just thought, well, fuck, if I'm going to be trapped in Portland, I want some awesome players to hang out with and play, yeah. you know? Yeah. And I, I'm a huge fan of early AC. I mean, I like ACDC, even Brian Johnson stuff, but basically from like, you know, when they started, you know, with the Bon Scott 74, 75, whatever, until, you know, 80 back in black. I, that is like, you know, my formative years of learning music. And I learned how to play all those songs wrong you know, for, like that's some of the first stuff i learned i mean i think the first thing i ever played and like i ended up being the singer for it in salem when i was uh in eighth eighth grade um we did dirty deeds and the dude chickened out my buddy chickened out and i ended up going well mm -hmm. i don't even play Fuck, five months and we ended up playing the school um uh like the last day of school in the uh in the auditorium and we did like, shh, fuck, I don't know, four songs. And I think I sang one or two of them. Um, and so anyways, um, yeah, I love all that stuff. So it just kind of was a natural progression and we're, we've got shows booked up until shh, actually I'm not going to be here in June. So I think um, Craig Montoya, who was the bass player for Everclear and he's a Portland, you know, I think he's, Base. He's been based out of here for, I think he's probably mm -hmm. born here. I'm not sure, but I, I feel like he's been here since a small child. I never asked him, but um, I think he's going to fill in for us in June or fill in for me. So, and he's got a Slayer tribute that he does up here, Rain and Blood, that's pretty cool. I haven't seen nice. it yet, but the so, yeah, it's just like, you know, it's a small scene. Paul Gilbert lives two miles from me. Oh, nice. I um, forgot he lived in Portland. Yeah, I just did a thing with him for DiMarzio. I saw, um, I saw Larry a where he's, always, he's always talking about riding his bike around Portland. I thought that was funny. <laughs> yeah. Just does can't he? Ima oh, can't I imagine the mighty I, Paul Gilbert just biking through Portland like a normal human. <laughs> I, I can't actually. Yeah. I, I have to. Uh, that's funny. Well, you know, it's 
he's over in like, he's like two miles from me. So he's a little more central. I mean, I'm fairly close, but he's, he's like super more central. I gotcha. like, Are you still playing with Paul? Yeah. I just did a thing for, for DeMarzio pickups with him. I gotcha. He was, um, they, when we did it here in Portland and, uh, Jeff Bowers, who's played with Paul, is also from Salem originally. I love Jeff. Uh, that was the first time I ever really got to play with, with Jeff. We did that yeah. in, um, gosh, I think October. If you go on uh, the DeMarzio web webpage, it's um, Paul Gilbert's new PG-13 pickups. And oh, that's they, awesome. We just did it right up the street here, like two miles in the other direction at uh, – yeah. What's it called? Oh. Hollowed, hollowed Grounds. Jeff is so good. Uh, He's playing on uh, Get Out of My Yard and Silence, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I don't know. I Paul's played with so many people. It's hard to like. I think so, though. Yeah, Jeff's, Jeff lives down in L.A., but yeah, he's a Salem guy. He's that's, younger that's awesome. than me. He's, like, he's 10 years younger, so we didn't really know each other. I already moved to, to uh, Los Angeles. And I think he moved probably – at the same age I did. I think he moved in his early 20s, whatever. I got gotcha. So went to MI and all that. I think yeah, he teaches yeah. at MI. He teaches there. Yeah, he teaches there. Mm -hmm. So all Yeah, the, all this, Jeff's awesome. Yeah. He's, he's awesome, dude. Great awesome drummer. Guy. All this um, talk about cities has got me thinking about a, a pretty big question with musicians, especially upcoming musicians. Do you have to move to a city to make a career for yourself in uh, the entertainment industry, but specifically music? What do you think? Well... No, no, but I think it's one of those situations where if you start a band with your buddies and you're really good and word of mouth and you're undeniably good, but I mean, like that's all subjective really. Um, but I don't think so because there's a lot of bands coming out of a lot of weird places. Now, if you're a musician and you want to connect with other musicians and, and really get into that whole thing, yeah, I think it helps. Okay, and you found that to be but true for yourself? If you're starting a band, no. Okay. Gotcha. I don't think so. Hmm. I mean, there's, there's I mean, definitely... I mean, it helps been... to be in a bigger city with a bigger yeah. music scene. The funny thing is, and, you know, Portland's got original stuff here, but, like, the, the, the stuff that really, like... And I just kind of fell into it. The stuff that really has been making money here has been tribute cover stuff. And the DC's... Uh, we're we're an homage band. We don't dress. Right. We just kind of dress. We we almost dress more like the Ramones as much as we do like <laughs> ACDC. Yeah. It's like it's like denim and like you know cut off t shirt kind of. Right. You know what I mean? Man, the tribute we, we, thing we, is we huge look, right now. I mean, I I did a Journey tribute. I've done an Alice in Chains tribute, and they're both. Yeah, know, it's crazy. Money. Like people. I mean, it's cool, but it's kind of sad because yes, yes, I yes. feel like I feel like people are getting lazy. Just yes, but but there's there's also like, a, you know, you know, you can't like my whole thinking on it was, well, I at some point I probably will do an original, but I already have an original band, so I don't really feel bad doing this. Right. You know what I right. mean? It's not, I don't feel like it's a cop out either way, yes. either or, but I have an original band. So this is just like really easy for like a bunch of people to get together and go, Hey man, let's, we all know, like, here's a common ground. I mean, you can sit down and spend the time and write songs and do this and do that. And I'm all for that. But if you want to get your bros together and go play, and I mean, and like I said, McSwain was so freaking good singing that Bond Scott shit that I was like, oh, we're doing this. I don't give a shit. There's already another ACDC tribute band in town that does pretty good, but mm -hmm. they're kind of more Brian Johnson. So I was like, fuck, right. who cares? You know, we're all crushing musicians and it's fun. So, um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I, I like, uh, I just like to play. Yeah, and that's that's a good thing. I mean, what you're describing is a nice, beautiful thing, like, you know, paying homage to people you love. Yeah, absolutely. Like, we don't wear the wigs. We don't do yeah. And it's cool if those bands do that. I mean, whatever. That's, you know, that's your dignity on the line, not mine. <laughs> yes, thank you. And, I'm glad and, you're saying and, all this. <laughs> you know, it's all good. And, you know, some of the bands don't do that. And some of them do. And um, I always just like to you know, see people kind of go somewhat, I mean, ultimately the music's got to be kick-ass. Right. But, um, you know, I, I did this whole thing as like, 
You can't see ACDC circa 79. I almost called it the DC 79 because that was the last year Bon Scott toured with them Mm -hmm. uh, before he passed away. It actually coming up here in the next week, I think it was February 18th or 19th or something like that. I think he passed away. Wow. So that's coming up. But um, I just was a big fan of that whole, I, 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 watched the um, Let There Be Rock movie they did in Paris. I believe it was filmed in 79. And I just saw that and I was like, man, what a fucking ferocious fucking band that was. Like that shit still like, you know, makes the hair stand up on my arms and fucking gives me a rock and roll fucking hard on. Cause yeah. it's just so powerful and just like, just crushing. And I saw that and I went, man, there's nobody capturing this. And that was my whole thing is like, let's fucking capture that. Yeah, exactly. Like, let's capture the spirit of ACDC, you know, late seventies. And I actually like the original set list. I, I took that whole set list from that 79 and went, fuck yeah, fuck yeah, fuck it. Yeah. And then added like <laughs> other hits, you know, from that era. And then, you know, like I said, we do three, we do hell's bells back in black shoot the thrill and you shook me all night long. And okay. for me personally, those are like, I mean, you can do more Brian Johnson and that's cool, but there's enough Bon Scott shit that's fucking crushing yeah. that. And I think a lot of people are like, you know, I think a lot of the hardcore ACDC fans, that's like, they fucking come out. They love that shit. You, you guys do if and you want blood, right? Oh, fuck yeah. Yeah, that's <laughs> a classic. That's, we crush that too, yeah. man. I mean, I bet you Swain do. kills Scott. that. He yeah. kills You got to send me a video that's of that, man. That's one of my favorites. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's fun. I mean, it's just fun because it's just ferocious. Attitude, there's, absolutely. There's no, and you know what? I, I learned so much breaking down um, all those songs and how they put the bass lines together and, you know, um, the history of just like early ACDC, Mark Evans, the you know original bass player, I call him the original bass player. There was another guy or two before that, but as far as recorded ACDC, he was the bass player. George Young played bass on that stuff. There, um, mm. Malcolm, and, and he just passed away recently too, last year. And um, yeah. right before Malcolm, actually, a couple months, I wanna say, or a month. Um, but anyways, um, it's really clever and you know just learning the whole learning the whole just history of like where all this stuff comes from which if you want to ask me later ask me about quincy jones because he's been doing some interviews lately and that guy's that guy's my new fucking idol (laughs) please tell me about he should he i already have respect for him but right now that dude's like my new idol. I yes. just read this new, and I, this new inter, some, um, one of my buddies, um, uh, is a, uh, in the, in, uh, San Jose area. He's a, he's a trauma doctor. He's a Buck Cherry fan. I actually met him at some Buck Cherry gigs and he sent me that interview. He sent me the text and I just read it yesterday and I was like, wow. Yes, fucking I've Quincy heard, Jones is the fucking shit. Yeah, you're like the fourth person I've heard talk about the interview, and I have not read it. So do me the favor and tell me what what it's about and what you like about it because I gotta know. Well, that guy's just man. I just want people to go read it. Really, I mean, they should really hear it from him. I don't want to bastardize, but he basically just because the dude's 85, and everything he's done is, I mean has been pretty much fucking the shit. Um, the guy's got a track record. So he, dude, he goes back to the freaking thirties. I mean, yeah. this dude's like jazz guy. He's a fucking jazz guy. Yeah, he yeah, worked sure. with fucking Herbie Hancock, Miles Davis. I mean, he started out with these fucking jazz guys. So he knows his roots from all the way back. And he kind of talks about how um, pop music and producers and he said uh, producers now are greedy and lazy and pop music's lazy hmm. and nobody knows anything about the roots which I've always said also I'm not gonna I'm not saying I'm, I'm fucking on genius level but I, th- I don't think anybody knows like people just don't do their homework anymore they just go oh 
I think just everything feels so right now anyways. I know there's good shit out there, but I'm just talking about pop music. Right. Um, it just feels really prefabricated and cookie cutter, which you probably say that a lot about it early fifties and sixties and seventies pop too, but sure. um, And you know, he's worked with Michael Jackson and he basically doesn't pull any punches, doesn't pull any punches with Michael Jackson. Just that he fucked the guy. He's an 85 year old musical genius that just doesn't give a fuck. And he calls it like we all want to call it. And there's no repercussions for him. None, none. Uh, one, because he's old, and, and two, because he's done so it's just a beautiful so fucking thing. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, to that, to um, talks about Thriller, he talks about Michael Jackson and how Machiavellian and cutthroat he was. And he talks about Michael Jackson's plastic surgery. He fucking talks about the Kennedy assassination and fucking Sinatra, and he knows who did it, and he tells you who did it. Wow. And, <laughs> And just all this crazy shit that he can't fucking talk. Some of the shit he can talk about, and some of it's he's like, oh, fuck, I can't talk about that. <laughs> but it's just, it's fucking crazy. It's just like, it's so good. And you're just like, wow, refreshing. Yeah, exactly. That's a good word. We need more refreshing. of that. Refreshing. Just refreshing. You know, that guy came out of fucking bebop. <laughs> so yeah. he knows fucking musicianship. Yeah. All the way to classical to everything and to hear him comment on this shit. You're like, Oh yeah. You're like pretty much the fucking Oracle preach on (laughs) preach on Q preach on. That's incredible. I want to go back to the ACDC thing. Cause I got to ask, did you have any opinions on the, the Axl Rose ACDC thing? Um, I did. And it really wasn't, you know, look, Does it diminish it? Yeah, I think they should. I th- I, I think they should. I don't know. I mean, I, I've kind of got some insider trading info, and I get it. Axel Young, I mean, Axel Rose, Axel Young. <laughs> for any, for fucking, it is Axel Young. They should just call it Axel Young. <laughs> That's you a heard great, it here first. That's a great idea. <laughs> you heard it here first. Axel Young with the fucking lightning bolt. Yeah, in the middle. In yeah. the fucking middle, Absolutely. and like, a, and like two guns yeah. were facing <laughs> out in each direction. <laughs> fucking the two guns with a lightning bolt through the middle. Fucking <laughs> Axel, Axel Young. There's the pitch. I love it. Yeah. Copyright it. Call my lawyer. <laughs> um, anyways, um, I get it. Axel's a fucking huge Bon Scott fan. He loves ACDC. I get it. If if they asked me right now, point blank, and said, "Hey." Kelly, we need a fucking bass player. I'd go, uh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> How do you say no? Yeah, exactly. So, so because it's fucking Angus Young, it's Axl Rose. Whatever you think about it, he can sing the songs. It absolutely. sounds like Axl Rose singing ACDC. Absolutely. Um, is it ACDC? Fuck no. But it's parts of ACDC and, you know... I just think fucking uh, Angus should just come up with the DCs and fucking play with us. Yeah, there you go. I think it would. I think it would sound more like ACDC. Yeah. But you know, I get it. You know, Axel wants to fucking. That's probably his childhood dream. Right. To sing for ACDC. Fuck, come on. It's his passion. Absolutely. So I can't really comment. And you know, as far as the whole, if you want to ask me about Guns N' Roses. I think Izzy should have done it. Mm -hmm. You think Izzy should have done it? Fuck yeah. I think they should have fucking paid him some real money. Hmm. I think, I, I I don't know. I think, I think they probably went in. You were the quiet guy that wrote all the cool songs. Yeah. You know, we've already got fucking me and Slash and, you know, Duff wants to do it and, Mm-hmm. This fucking other guy's a way better guitar player and Richard and Fortis fucking, is insane. Yeah. You're by the yeah, way, you're talking dude, to two of the biggest great. GNR I fans it. ever. I mean, they should have at least had Adler. I mean, didn't Adler come up and play at least a couple times he with them? He's played several times with him, yep. Yeah, I mean, he should. I get it. And, you know, I get, you know, the whole I get why they didn't ask Gilby and all that shit. I and mean, Matt's it's like him, yeah. yeah, and Matt too, and I was just gonna say Matt and and 
you know, I get it. I get their reasoning. They're like, well, we got the three fucking powerhouse guys. Although I'm a huge Izzy fan. Gotta say, yeah, I yeah fucking, absolutely. How can I respect that fucking guy. I think, you know, I think he's a stand up fucking dude. And I don't know. I just feel like they probably just fucking lowballed him. And he was like, eat a fucking dick. Yeah. I got money. I don't need your fucking money. Go, go out there and do your shit. But I still think they should have paid him and he should have fucking done it. Yeah, if that was the case, I just feel that's what the case is. That's, that's, usually that's what, what it is. definitely seemed like. Now there is an argument I heard that, you know, Axel and slash and Duff all had so many different projects that they were out working, keeping the GNR name alive, so to speak, where Izzy fell off the Dude, map. He did a lot of music, but it was dude, never fuck that. The GNR fucking name was always there. Uh, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. It was always there. I get it. It was like when the Eagles got back together mm, yes. and Don Henley and Glenn yeah. Fry went, fuck you, we're getting paid more because yeah. we were out in the spotlight. And exactly. I get that. I think it's a but, similar thing. You know, I get that. But I still think fucking, I mean, yeah, sure. You can say that. But I still think, you know, yes, Richard Fortas is a better guitar player, but I would love to see Izzy do it. But well, Izzy's same such time, an integral part of that original lineup. I mean, he was... A huge part. I of think so. Yeah, I mean, he, I he so. nobody I mean, knows I, anything I, about him, but he was so you know such a big songwriter. And you know, I remember when when they got rid of Adler and they got Matt Sorum. And no, no, no knock on Matt Sorum because I think Matt Sorum's a fucking really fucking solid fucking kick ass rock drummer. Um, but I as soon as they got rid of fucking Stephen Popcorn Adler. And I heard him with, with Sorum. I'm like, this doesn't sound like Guns N' Roses anymore. It's different for sure. <laughs> Adler, I mean, had that vibe like, that, that you can't He had that fucking swingy. Yeah. It's like Charlie Watts with the Stones, man. Yeah. If you put another drummer in there, I don't think it would sound like the Rolling Stones. I mean, you could probably find someone to emulate him, but, right. Right. you know, I guess I'm sure they just get Steve Jordan and he'd throw his own vibe in there, but. Um, it wouldn't be the same. It just would not quite be the same. Right. I don't think. Yeah. Agreed. I mean, even with Daryl Jones playing bass, it sounds different to me. But, you know, they always have that oblong wheel. They, they, they always felt like one, like like it was a fucking bicycle and one of the wheels was oblong. Right, right. Swing, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. There was always like a little hitch in the get along, but it fucking worked. Yeah. The Izzy, um, thing, anyways, the Izzy know, thing's interesting because it's like, I. I don't know if he would have done it, even if it was all even and square. I mean, he left uh, when they were at the top of their game, basically because they got too big. And now they're doing Who's you know, that? Izzy. Oh, Izzy? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, he was done. He was done. He was smart. That dude fucking sniffed it out. And he was like, he was the first one. He got sober. And he was just like, dude, this is a fucking nightmare. Yeah. I got some money. I, that guy's yeah. not hurting for money. He's got publishing. He oh, gets absolutely. fucking guaranteed. He gets fucking checks in the mail all the time and goes, oh, yeah. woohoo. Absolutely. I think that dude just goes out and rides his fucking dirt bike all day out in the fucking desert and gets together and plays music when he wants to. That's exactly what kind he's doing. Bob Dylan based on, yeah, based on um, some people that have interviewed him or been close to him or something that I've read, some things they've said. Yeah, That's basically what he's life, doing. Man. Yep. Quality of life. Go. Yep. Comes back to that. You know, I got to respect that. Yeah. I respect it. <laughs> He's doing what he wants. So you mentioned yes. uh, Buck Cherry's doing some fly dates. Um, could you tell us yeah. a little, about, bit of, little bit about what fly dates are for those of us that might not know the listeners? Oh, uh, basically, you'll do like two or three shows. Like you do a couple shows on a weekend. It's like weekend warrior shit, but it's, right. it's cool because, you know, you, you get in your airplane and you fly out. And it's usually like we've been doing like uh, – We've been doing like some little theaters and some casinos and I actually really like playing casinos because um, you, you get your own room and the food's kick ass and, oh, yeah. <laughs> and you, you roll in the, you know, since it's a casino, there's plenty of fools just throwing money at them. So there's, they got so much money to fucking yep. spend. They're, they always have like nice auditoriums and, or, you know what I mean? Like PA and everything. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sure everything's best. always fucking top notch and, and, good crowds and cause everybody just stays at the casino and fucking parties. And you know, it's fun. It used to be casinos where bands go to die. Now it's casinos where bands go to live. 
So are, are fly dates good for, I mean, what, what are they, where is their place? Like, is it, a, is it preferable to a full on tour or what do you think? No, no, no. You just basically, I'm like, we'll do like one or two weekends. Sure. Um, we'll fly out. We'll fly out to like, um, actually next month we are flying to, uh, we're doing, um, I think four or five East coast dates. So that one we'll just probably just, you know, they're all pretty close. You know, the East coast is, it's all pretty close when you're doing the Northeast, like, like Jersey and New York and Long Island and, you know, you'll, th- you know, throw some Philly in there, whatever, Boston, whatever that, yeah. Pennsylvania, you'll, um, sometimes we'll just fly out and do one show. Yeah. We'll fly out and play. I think we got like a one-off in May. It's just one, di- one, one gig and, you know, I'll fly out the day before, play the show the next day and fly back and, sure. and then, sure. um, and then starting in, um, and we're basically doing that until the beginning of June. And then June we fly to Europe and I think it's, I think it's game on basically until the fall. I think we're spending the, uh, you know, a decent chunk of the summer, um, going out on tour. Oh, good, good. So, That's what and, I was wondering. And then in, yep. Yeah. And then in the meantime, we've started, um, I, I've been, you know, everybody's just kind of compiling, uh, music and, uh, we're talking about starting up and doing another record at some point, either I'm thinking at the end of the year or next year. Good. The, the most recent year. one was uh, rock and roll, correct? Yep. Yeah, That's the one. Great. So how is, um, are you guys doing these fly dates because Josh is doing the conflict or how's that tying in with that? Um, I think, I think they're kind of winding that down. Um, I think, um, I think we're doing now. I think everyone's just kind of taking a little break, you know, Buck Cherry for a long time, like over toured and, um, it kind of, um, I think a lot of it just burned out. It just people got burned out. Band band members got burned out. Um, you know, you can over tour when people are, you know, when you're like, uh, we'll go see them next time. They'll be here in like six months. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, it just kind of takes away from the draw. And those guys were going so hard for so long. I mean, I came in four years ago and I came in and I was like, holy shit. I mean, it was nonstop. Yeah. Um, like we, yeah. like we took a little break for the holidays and then we were back at it again. And it just got to the point where it's like, you know, you got to rejuvenate and like, let the people miss you without like, you know, when we do these little dates here and there, it's kind of like, okay, they're still around. Like, we just kind of like, we need to take a break. And those guys went and did the conflict. And, and like I said, I, I was gone so much when I moved here in Portland because I lived in LA for so long. And, um, and I just, I'm taking the chance right now to, like kind of introduce myself to the eco- musical ecosystem here in Portland. So, and I've just been doing stuff around here yeah. locally, like I said, but um, yeah, we're, we're getting ready to gear back up. So it's, it's, it's been a nice break. Yeah. So how do you, how do you and, balance a, a personal life with a work life when that's your life being on the road all the time? Um, that's just, I you know, that is your personal life. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, <laughs> yeah, that's your first life. That's what you do. You I just honestly, I love to play music. Um, it's just always like, I don't know. It's just part of my DNA and it's what I love to do. And I consider myself, I'm fucking grateful and, and very fortunate. And, and, uh, you know, like I, you know, mentioned earlier in 2016, I wasn't sure I was ever going to do anything again. And, and, uh, you know, to come through that whole thing, you know, I was already grateful, but, but music and playing bass kind of got me through that. Um, yeah. And, uh, I just love to play music, whether I'm, you know, and I teach locally a little bit at my buddy's got a music school here just across the river in Washington here in Vancouver, Washington, across from Portland. Um, I'll go and I, I worked with him before too at those, uh, he used to actually was one of the big wigs over at the school of rock. He started the Portland one and then, um, um, became like a corporate dude and then left and he's, he's got a music school and I'll go in there and teach bass. And it's like, I just like being involved with music and, and playing bass. And it's like, you know, fuck, I'll, 
you know, I just like to play. It's just one of those things, you know. Yeah, I'm just grateful. I, you know, I'm grateful to be in Buck Cherry. I'm grateful. I get to. I love playing with other people. I mean, so taking this time off with Buck Cherry, you know, I've done a little. I actually filled in for um, um, for Goldfinger. Um, yeah, Prince. I did a show. I did a show with. I filled in. Sorry, my girl's calling in, and I sent her a little text. Um, <laughs> Was that when doves cry the ringtone? <laughs> was that? Did you hear? Yeah, it was. Yeah. Did you hear that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, well, you know, the funny thing is when I got this phone, because you're like, do you have an iPhone? I just got rid of my iPhone. Oh, okay. I had one for years, and it took a shit on me right when all that, like, iPhone got busted, um, oh, Apple got yeah, busted, yeah, yeah. And, it all, and it deleted a bunch of my text messages and photos and all this crap, and I got so pissed off. I just I just went and got a droid. I got a freaking LG or whatever the heck it is. Nice. And I was just like, screw Apple. It's a cult. Um, <laughs> it is, I man. Mean, I, I can't leave. I just love my Apple shit too much. <laughs> I'm telling you, it really is. It's like but you either no love one can it deny or you that. Don't it absolutely care. is a cult. <laughs> I mean, it really is. It is the the cult of Apple. Yeah. But um, but anyways, um, so she got my phone because she's she's a Samsunger, and and. She went in and programmed Crazy Bitch as, <laughs> as her hilarious. ringtone. And right before I left for these last dates, because I got it right before that, she kept calling me. And, and it was really like whoever set the ringtone set the DB like super loud. So it was like, <laughs> and I'm just like, and it was freaking me out every time she'd call me. And I was just like, no, this is going. And I just want doves cry because it's something I want to hear all the time. Sure. Yeah. I love you know, grateful for crazy bitch, but dude, if I got to hear that song one more time, you, know, <laughs> well, you play I don't it need it so on much. a ringtone. <laughs> I love playing it, yeah. but I, I don't want to hear it on a fucking ringtone when my chicks yeah. call me. And for that to happen while they're sitting next to me, like, I think she kind of did it like a ha ha. Right. Like, like just to embarrass me. And I'm like, no, 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 no. That's not happening. Buck Cherry plays in standard, right? Uh, yes, we do. Nice. That song is in B, if I remember. Uh, you are correct. You've had that's, to play it before. I assume. That's been a while, but yeah. <laughs> BB, BB, slide. Yeah. Yeah. You might not even be able to hear a B chord anymore without getting PTSD. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Da, da, da. Check my tuning. Oh, Who's yeah. got a clip on? Yeah. <laughs> that's hilarious. Well, man, anytime you guys. Uh, come near charlotte or anywhere over here let us know yeah you just hit me first. up dude you know i will absolutely man i've i've seen you guys a bunch Ooh, it's always so good every yeah, time i've seen you a few times myself yeah well and i don't know if you knew there was a little shake up and and, and a couple of the guys uh yes and of the guys i don't left. know the details and i don't know if you're allowed to talk about them but i would well i would like I to hear basically just summarized it i think when i was talking about the people burnout. touring and touring and touring yeah. i mean it's like being away in the military uh, you know, in combat for two, eight years nonstop. And I think you could probably chalk that up to a lot of bands. You could probably, you know, pull it apart and, you know, go through the history of bands and go, yeah, just too much on the road, too much of this, too much of that. It just, it's over, you know, people just burn out instead of like being smart and taking little breaks, you know, in my humble opinion, that's what I would have done. I, like I said, I'm I'm with them four years. I'm Johnny come lately, but I still feel like I have a perspective from standing back and looking at it. Like I'm in it right now, but I still feel like I have a bit of perspective. Right. Because I didn't come into it at that point. Like like Goldfinger after a while, being in that band for so long, I didn't have a perspective. It's like the forest from the trees syndrome, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like you're so immersed in the middle of it it's kind of hard to like be subjected because all you know is your, you know, version of what is reality right. and what you yeah. think it is. But once you stand back, like you kind of stand back sometimes and go like, well, wow, like sometimes it's almost like a codependent slash even abusive, you know, it's just like, you're like, that's unhealthy. We shouldn't be doing that for so much for so long. Yeah. Like you need to take breaks, but it's like, you know, you got to go out and make money. It's like, that's what you do. I, I'm a lifer. I, I play music. I don't know how to do anything else. So, 
you know, when I'm not doing Buck Cherry, I got to find other things to do to make money. And I'm not like one of these technical whiz people. Like I'm a, I'm a die in the wool, stand on stage, play music. And I, I you know, no matter what, I, I, that's why I learned how to play all kinds of, I can play fretless. I, I can, I can, I can fake my way through an upright. You would might, you might say, Oh, the guys, I didn't know Kelly played upright bass. You know, I just kind of like tried to learn everything. I, yeah. You know, I, I'm, I got a 12 string bass. It's like cheap trick. It's basically a four string, but like I, I, I play fretless. I've tried playing, uh, you know, four five, six. I mean, I didn't even own a four string when I joined Buck Cherry. I had to go get a four string. I remember, I remember you were playing mostly fives. Yeah, it was all fives. All that stuff I did with Paul. I played all those custom five strings by Buddy Joe. Yes. Here I remember those. Yeah. Those are awesome. With that big yeah. horn that attached to the top. That was awesome. The the the, the Fenderas, as I call them, because they were bolt on, uh, basically bolt on um, Federas, just that whole yeah. single cut. I think so that's funny. What you a lot playing. of companies are making those now. Ibanez is making yeah. them now. Yeah. Um, uh, Spectre just came out with their first one. A lot of companies were making it for a while. Um, yeah, I call them the Kellicasters because they kind of look like big. <laughs> That's awesome. Was, I think, uh, I think that's what I you were playing. I was actually going to do it. What's that? I said, I think that's what you were playing when we first met at the Great Guitar Escape. Exactly. Yeah. That's the first time exactly. I saw those things. That blew my mind. Yeah. Yep. 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 So I'm playing, uh, you know, I got, I got, I, I love my Spectres still. And I play, I play Yamahas. Uh, my buddy Scott Marceau uh, became, he was at Duncan and uh, he's an awesome dude. He went to Yamaha and, you know, he, he's, he's, you know, hooked me up with some killer, some of those BBs and stuff I like, but, um, yeah, you know, I like everything, dude. I, bases to me are like shoes, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. I, I'm a shoe freak. I'm a bass freak. Um, I just like to play all kinds of different things. I, you know, basically if you have a really killer P bass and you have a really nice modern bass, you're, kind of set for like you know because yeah, yeah, yeah. when i go yeah because people either want a p bass or they want you know or you play your modern bass that you can dial in all kinds of tones yeah, i mean exactly. i got a bill nash p bass that always wins the bass wars whenever i bring in a bunch of basses a producer like on a record or a demo or whatever everybody always goes oh play that p bass man it's just it's a maple neck it's like a 50 seven or whatever 58 59 kind of knockoff and it always wins the base fight but <laughs> you know i love my ergo night dynamic specters too yeah so well being a good bass yeah, player is probably one of the most marketable things you can be everybody always needs a bassist <laughs> yeah i mean it really is like the bastard child you know it's kind of like that thing and so it, it's like it's kind of like you know, we do a lot of the grunt work almost in a way, but mm -hmm. I mean, that's how it's perceived. I don't feel like it's grunt work. I think, I think the bass is like, I mean, we control the tone center. You know what I mean? Yeah. The feel. If, 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 if the guitars are playing a G, G major, you know, and I bounce, I go from a G to a D, man, mm -hmm. I fucked that whole feeling up, man. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, I, I can make the tension or break the tension. Yep. So I, once I found, found kind of found out like, wow, bass really is kind of the, kind of the foundation tonal control center. Plus you're part drums too, you know? Yeah, absolutely. It's like, it's like your, your right hand's kind of the kick and the snare and your left hand lives in the melody guitar world. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's kind of this weird hybrid. That's like, you know, whenever a drummer will say something and everybody looks at him, I go, I always raise my hand and go, I speak drummer. Here's what he means. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you play so, such so, a wide range of stuff. I mean, comparing just, yeah, just, just I love music. Yeah. I just, love all styles of music, man. I find it all fascinating. Yeah. Just off the top of my head. I mean, let's take like Paul Gilbert or, or Stork or something, which is more on the, complex side versus buck cherry which is more on the simpler side do, do you what yeah is, buck cherry's buck cherry's rock and roll yeah. and stork is fucking math 
Yeah, math, exactly. Yeah, math. Yeah, and, 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 if, and if, uh, you know, the funny thing is with that record, <clears throat> you know, Thomas, the drummer, just hit me up. He's like, hey, man, you know, we're having troubles, like, uh, you know, keeping a bass player because it's kind of a recording project, you know. And he's like, would you want to come in and, you know, can you come down and plan a couple songs? And I was like, I'm like, yeah. And I hadn't heard any of it. I heard the old stuff. But I hadn't heard any of the new stuff with yeah. uh, the singer. Yeah. Uh, so he had me come in and do that. And I, I was just like, next thing I know, I was just like, hey, we're doing photos today. Why don't you just be in the band? And I'm like, huh? Nah, Dude, <laughs> he had to, I have never, I have never screamed the, I've never screamed fuck that loud during a recording session as much as I did playing uh, on a couple of those Stork <laughs> songs. Yeah. yeah. All the time. I actually <laughs> asked him, and I can't even remember the fucking names of the songs. Like, I literally walked in without hearing these songs, uh, a couple of them, and he just was like, okay. And he goes, and I just looked at her and I went, how many time signatures are in this one song? I asked <laughs> Thomas the Lang. Yeah. My, my, my homie. Oh, Thomas I, how many is time shit. signatures? And he goes, he goes, he goes, well, seven. But I'm playing seven different time signatures with my feet, yep, but my hands right. are playing four four the whole time. Yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> and I just went, "Fuck you." <laughs> <laughs> Gotta love Thomas Lang. <laughs> it has a fucking calculator. I love him. Yeah, he's but yeah, he is just like he is a fucking monster of all monsters. How I ended up on stage with Thomas Lang and Paul Gilbert, I still scratch my head. But. Um, I was wondering yeah, if you had a what, preference between the math and the rock, or if you, you know, swung back and forth depending on whatever, or if you like playing more you know technical what? stuff. Or... Um, I like it all. Um, it was really challenging doing some of that Paul stuff. And Paul is such a phenomenal teacher that like he would teach me how to play the stuff because he's so fucking good at teaching and breaking stuff down. He would send me Dropbox videos of him with the bass going, okay, because, you know, he's got his music school set up and all. Yeah. He was doing stuff. He was doing Skype stuff uh, back in, like, 2000. When did I do that? 13 or 12? Is that when or you and 10. Thomas and Paul toured together? Uh, I think that's when we did the record. And then the tour we did, I think we did Japan in 12. And then, is that right? Or was it 13 and 14, maybe? I, I don't know. Um, it, it, it was such a blur right around that time when I started, Buck, started because I toured with Paul and then I do Goldfinger stuff and then I started and then I got the Buck Cherry gig and it was just Buck Cherry nonstop um, up until like, you know, we started mellowing out a little bit last year. And then, mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, Paul would send me stuff with just like breaking down like Scarified, for example, yeah. the Racer X song. Um, he would break me down that, that whole um, hammer-on break. Do -do 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 yeah, the tapping part, yep. So he would do it slow and go, here's how, here's the frets, here's where I'm doing it at. And then he would slowly, he would speed it up. And he sent me those, and I went, oh, fuck, you're a genius. And then, um, so, like, he's really great. So a lot of that stuff, I, I was just like, there's no way I could sit down. Because I'm like, I couldn't pick it out with my ear. Cause it's so fast and crazy. Absolutely. And so he would break it down for me and I went, well, fuck yeah, I got it. And then we would do it. And it, it was never a moment when we toured with him, um, other than having a sweaty right hand, but I used, I got smart and, you know, I wear wristbands now, but, um, I, I never had any like issues with that, with that breakdown. I never had the deer in the headlights moment. Cause he fucking taught me that so well. Right. So, I mean, you know, it's one thing to play it all the time, but after a while, when you do something, it becomes muscle memory. Yeah. Well, that brings me but to I go next back question. Now and I go, fuck, how did I play that shit? And yeah. then I pick up those bases and I go, oh yeah, those bases are set up so low. Oh yeah. yeah. So easy to play that I'm like, oh fuck. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So that leads me to my next question. What, I mean, let's talk about tour prep. Like what are the things you do? to prepare for playing a bunch of shows where you need to be on your game? Uh, fuck, I don't know. Same shit I always do, really. I mean, I, I try to, like, not be in horrible shape because the road wears you out. Um, 
I mean, it really gets kind of grueling and, and, and you kind of have to keep your immune system up. And um, I don't know, I, you know, like I've been, I get up and do cardio every day. I go on a little jog in the neighborhood. Even if it's raining, I put a rain jacket on. And even if I'm like too tired to jog, um, which lately I've been, my stamina is getting better. Um, but um, I, I just try to exercise and, and you know, yeah. keep my stamina. I mean, I'm not young anymore. I'm going to be, shit, I'm 50, dude. <laughs> you know, I'm 50. I, I mean, and Stevie's, my, the other guitar player in Buck Cherry, he's 50. And that guy's in great shape, you know. Stevie's in great shape, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and it's like, you know, he's also a teeny tiny little Filipino dude. <laughs> yeah, he is. <laughs> and I'm just like... Uh, you know, my, I, my metabolism, I have to really work at it. I don't have that super, like, you know, he works out a lot. And I think his metabolism and Josh too. That's the other thing is like, I got to stay on my toes or I'll, I'll look like the fat bass player on stage, you know, standing next to those guys. <laughs> those guys and it's just like, yeah. I, I can't have that, man. And Josh I gotta is super be in tall shape. too, so. You know, Josh, Josh isn't that tall. How tall is that tall? No, dude, he's like 5'11". Oh, okay. Maybe it's just because he's like always he's up there. Everybody thinks he's super tall. Everybody yeah. thinks I'm tall, and they stand next to me, and they go, dude, you're short. How tall are you? 5'7". You're 5'7". Okay, I'm 5'10", so. Yeah, I'm 5'7". Josh is 5'11". He's just so skinny. I he gotcha. looks super tall. Yeah, and that's then, a good you know, point. I, didn't, I never noticed that. Stevie's like 5'6". He's about an inch shorter than me. I, I mean, you know, I'm not that much taller than him. You know, and... Yeah. and uh, and then Kevin, the other guitar player that came in, uh, Kevin and Kevin's fucking awesome. Kevin's, he and I now we're on the same side of the stage and it's kind of funny. Um, we're, he's a little bit more slender than me. I'm a little more, um, you know, I'm a little more squatty French Canadian. Um, but, um, <laughs> like I'm a little more barrel chested than he is, but we're, we're almost the same height, the same physique. So it's just like, I have my hair, like, I'm like, we probably look like twins. And, and the funny thing is, is he would bring like, we would bring the same, like kind of similar clothes. Oh, Cause no. you know, you kind of all have that band look. <laughs> yeah. So he'd be, we'd show up and he's like, oh shit, you're wearing the Western shirt. And he's like, all right, I'll wear the t-shirt. So like, we actually have this thing once that he'll, he'll text me. Um, I'm going Western tonight <laughs> just to give me a heads up so we don't yeah. show up in the same with, with the same shit on because yeah. it's, it's pretty funny too. So That's great. So, um, yeah, I'm trying to get a different look going here maybe so we don't look all super similar. I'm growing my hair out a little bit more. Oh, okay. I lost it all. I lost it all when I had the stupid fucking cancer. It all Man. fucking fell out. And I was well. cultivating the shit out of it too. It was so long. I remember it was getting pretty long. Dude, it was so long. And then... That fucking, all that fucking chemo they gave me. Yeah. I was just like, all right, we're shaving it off. Fuck it. Cause it was starting to, it was starting to fall out. Man. That's so, rough. But anyways, it's growing back. It looks fucking great. I love it. Who cares? <laughs> yeah, it's just hair. Awesome <laughs> Thank you. So, um, so you, so I mean, yeah, touring, I don't, you know, I don't do shit. I just, I just try to know the songs. That's, that's it. All, that's all you can do, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's like it's like muscle memory, you know. I just I try to stay in shape, and um, you know, I haven't fucking drank in years. I uh, next month, the end of next month will be thirteen years since I've had a drink of alcohol, and oh, that's really helped my longevity like immensely because sure. I was falling apart. Helps your immune system yeah. too. Congratulations! Just, oh, dude, it just it fucks your body up, dude. So bad, it was just like it was just chewing my guts up. Yeah, and I was just like, man, I can't do this anymore. It just it wore me out psychologically. I just got sick and tired of feeling sick and tired. Yeah, is everyone else in so, Bucherry in a similar place, or is that kind of yeah? Nobody be... else drinks. I got no, you. We're all non drinkers. Everybody just it just you know we're all kind of uh... well. What's the line in lit up? You're on 10, but I'm on 11. <laughs> I mean, that song is basically sums up everybody in the band's kind of uh, uh, personalities you know, in a way as far as, yeah. you know, when we like something, we all really like something, you know? So I think that kind of, you know, when it came to drinking, I definitely, or, or a lot of stuff, I, I go to 11. Yeah. You know, it's pretty spinal tappy, but yeah. 
but yeah, we go to you know we go to eleven. So you're kind of the the consummate road dog here. I, I got to hear some like some crazy tour stories. I'm sure you've got a bunch. You know, crazy tour stories. It's so funny because all the crazy shit happened when I was way younger. Mm -hmm. And um, since I like kind of stopped drinking, <laughs> I probably can't tell. You know, there's a lot of stories I don't even want to tell, to be honest with you. <laughs> That's your um, prerogative. <laughs> um, you know, I definitely... Um, Mm, gosh, what can I really tell? <sighs> Fuck. You know, right now it's such a, it's, it really is like, it's what I love to do and it's my job. And I really like, I'm all about the gig. I don't like fuck the gig off. My whole day revolves around the gig. Yeah. So I kind of, you know, I try not to like, it's, it's kind of boring. You know, people think it's so, oh, dude, fucking Mark Cherry has got me crazy. And it's like, it's a bunch of like middle-aged dudes sitting around in their pajamas, farting in and watching fucking TV. <laughs> you know what I mean? Dr drinking coffee. Like, that's kind of what it's become. But it's like, we love, we just love playing. And, I, you know, I'm, I, I take it real, you know, I take it serious enough to where, that's why I don't drink and I don't, I don't fuck the gig up. So, you know, I mean, yeah, there's some crazy shit that goes on, but everybody's kind of married and has kids. It's, it's more like you get the crazy, like you get the crazy fans that you're just like, Whoa, wow. Okay. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Where you're Absolutely. just like, you're like, you know, a lot of those songs Josh wrote lyrically about shit that happened to him and, how, you know, when he was still a super fucking gnarly, fucking drug addict, fucking, you know, drinker, crazy person like the rest of us. And, and, uh, so some of the people, they're like, they insist, oh, yeah, man, you remember we totally got wasted with you that one night? And we're like, e no, <laughs> no, that didn't happen. Cause, you know, whoever they're talking about hasn't drank in 20 years yeah or whatever <laughs> you're right like <laughs> no i don't think we were doing coke with you but i'm glad you believe that right on <laughs> i think you might have done you too know? much <laughs> yeah so that's kind of funny but yeah i mean there's i fell downstairs numerous times and you know i stopped drinking jägermeister for reasons dude i did all that you know i was never like super out of control party person but i you know i definitely um I definitely have my moments of fucking insanity where I had to wake up the next day and apologize to people. Cause you know, generally like when you start blacking out, like if you play a day show and you haven't eaten all day and you start drinking screwdrivers, like right after you walk off stage, cause you've got a day off the next day and you know, you don't remember anything from about seven o'clock on and you have to apologize to people because <laughs> you said stuff that you're like, you're like, like your brother, your own flesh and blood brother who was doing merch for you on that tour wakes up the next day and looks at you and just shakes his head and goes, dude, <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> and I just look at him and go, and I'm still in my clothes from last night. And he goes, dude, what happened? He's like, he's like, I saw the exact moment. He's like, your eyes rolled in the back of your head and you turned around and you were somebody else. And like within 60 seconds, I was thrown out of the bar. He's all, it was the crazy shit. He's like, you literally just went and like some fucking other alter ego, fucking Walter ego, we'll call it. <laughs> fucking Walter ego took over. And he's like, you turned into another person. And evidently I was going up and down the halls of the hotel room, peeing all over people's doors and like <laughs> just fucking out of control. I don't remember. I mean, and at some point you got to go, uh, I can't even remember the crazy shit I'm doing. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I don't do that anymore on tour. That's how I prepare. Uh, there you go. Sounds like you were a total rock star to me. <laughs> I don't do that. <laughs> what do you guys do on your uh, days off? 
uh, go to a lot of malls. Yeah. Yeah. Or if I'm in a city where my friends are, I hang out with my friends. I'll go do laundry. Just, you know, just like try to do shit that's kind of normal people stuff. Yeah. Keep some, you know, or go see a cool. I like to go to guitar stores. I love to go to, um, I love thrift stores. Um, go see a movie. Um, you know, I like if if friends are in town, I, I really like to hang out with my friends. Yeah. That's the cool thing about traveling is I have friends all over the place. So, um, you know, just do stuff like that. Generally I'll, I'll do laundry and stuff if the, if the venue doesn't have laundry at it. Cause it's like, you know, you kind of got to, I, I sweat so bad on stage. It's like, I have to bring gig clothes, you know what I mean? And I try to like have stuff I can wear. Actually, I kind of dress the same off stage as I do on stage sometimes, but um, you know, I have my clothes get like, I wear a shirt at a show and it is just fucking drenched. So I, yeah. I never wear it again. So Absolutely. I got a lot of wet clothes I need to, to wash. Yeah. So yeah, you know, you know, clothing stores, music stores, you know, just fun shit. Just try and find something fun to do. Nice. Well, last question here for you. You've done so many projects. Do you have one that stands out to you more than the others or one that you more fond of anything like that? You know what? I like them all. <laughs> Cause I don't normally do shit if I don't like it. Right. That's fair. If it's something that's not fun, um, you know, everything's different for different reasons. I mean, I have fond memories of pretty much all the projects I've done. Um, I mean, I got to play, I got to play the whiskey of go-go in the punk band fear. I don't know if any of your fans know that band, but when I was a kid in high school in the mid eighties, that was like one of the only punk bands I really liked because they could fucking play their asses off. Their songs were awesome. And you know, the lyrics, I mean, just, it was like my favorite punk band. I got to play, you know, the Whiskey of Go-Go, a sold out show at the Whiskey, basically ground zero for that band. And to be able to do that in, you know, the, I think that was 96 or whatever it was, you know, 10 years later out of, out of high school and get to do that with one of my favorite punk bands. I mean, yeah, that, that was like, insane. that was fucking awesome. I'm sure so that place was just, you know, that stands out and, you know, doing the record with Dave Mustaine kind of stands out. Um, yeah. How about that? You guys ever think about doing anything like that again? Those guys were cool. That was a good group. Fuck. I don't know. You know, Buck Cherry's playing the O2 arena with the Scorpions and Megadeth next, I think it's June 17th or something like nice. that. Oh, nice, man. So I'm fucking really looking forward to that. Um, and I haven't seen Dave in a long time. So, you guys keep and up I know Jack, What's that? Do you guys keep up at all? Still talk or anything? Um, I saw him on the Gigant Tour. Um, I'm buddies with Name Drop. I'm buddies with Scott Ian from Anthrax, awesome. and they played up here. God, it's got to be like going on like eight years or something like that, whenever it was. And I met up with Scott because I was up here because my family's all up. It's before I moved back up. I was hanging out. And um, I. Um, I went to uh, I went to that and I ran into Dave. I like went and found him and said hey to him and he was super cordial and great and and um, yeah. I mean I don't know. I'll hit him up and be like hey dude. Yeah. That was like how long ago was that? Ninety five I think that came out. Ninety ninety five ninety six. I'm not even sure. But um, yeah, pretty crazy. You know, it's funny is people show up from time to time. With MD forty five CDs, nice, and I'll sign them with Buck Cherry things. That's awesome. Yeah, I had a dude show up in Canada with Goldfinger stuff before. Pretty funny. Cool. That's awesome. Yeah, it's kind of like yeah. you brought your own fans to Buck Cherry. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it kind of did sometimes. It's it's kind of cool. You know, yeah. it's cool. So yeah, I don't know. I love doing all that. You know, playing with Buck Cherry. I still fucking you know that's. Just, you know, some of my early, the first couple of shows, I was just reminiscing because it was, I think, four years ago in October that I started playing with those guys. And I was just reminiscing uh, 
the first handful of shows I did with those guys were festivals in South America with like Aerosmith and I was just kind of going like thinking like holy shit man that was four years ago fuck and that shit you know playing for the first time in Argentina and looking across the stage to the the wings of the fucking uh, place where the, the outdoor fucking venue we were playing look inside stage and I'm like going holy shit I'm like it's fucking Joey Kramer and you know I'm like there's big giant movie monitor screens behind me that I can't see and I'm like I'm like going fuck and I walk off stage and I was like dude Joey fucking Kramer and he goes dude Brad Whitford was standing right next to you like on our side of the stage you didn't That's see funny. him and I'm like no fuck cool <laughs> you know what I mean I'm like glad I didn't know it <laughs> Pretty sure Brad, or, or Brad Whitford or, or walking off. I got to tell this one because this one really was, you know, being a bass player and trying to, I try to be a bass player's bass player as much as I can. Uh -huh. Like I try to really play for the songs. I mean, I play an ACDC cover band and I really, you know, try to keep those songs pretty much true to form as much as I can. Um, and, you know, I walked off stage the first show I ever did with the uh, Thomas Thomas and Emmy on the vibrato tour. We did the first show we did at the House of Blues, right? Uh, and um, in LA, and uh, I remember I was so hungry, and we played like a two two and a half hour set, and it was it's always an evening with Paul Gilbert and friends, and so I remember because I don't like to eat a lot before I play because I don't want to be all. Ugh on stage yeah, yeah cause you know you get worked up and your adrenaline gets jacked up and the lights are hitting you and you know you gotta be you gotta really gotta be on point and um I um I beelined it like right off stage and it was great it was a crowded show um I was super stoked you know we played great everything was killer I went I sat down in front of this giant fruit platter and I pulled it up and it was, you know, I beat everybody. They were still up there. I was just like, I'm so hungry. And I ran and I just started feeding myself. And so like, you know, six, 30, 40 seconds behind me, Paul comes walking up. Emmy, his wife who played keyboards on that comes walking up. Um, Thomas comes walking up and they're all tiling off and grabbing waters on the other side of the room. And I'm sitting down in the corner, you know, the gunslingers or the, 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 the gunslinger's chair with my back against the wall so I can see everybody walking in. And and um and I'm just just eating it's like watermelon and pineapples and I'm like ah, drinking water. And right after everyone, about 30 seconds, Billy Sheehan comes walking in. And I and I sit there and I didn't know he was there. And I'm sitting there and my girlfriend's sitting right next to me. Um she came up on stage and, and or I mean backstage right after those guys like right before him and she's old school David Lee Roth fan and all that shit. And, cool. and he comes walking in and I'm on the left and he looks at me and I look at him and I go, Holy shit. I'm fucking, and it's just like this. I go, I'm so glad I didn't know you were here. And he just looks at me and he stops and I'm, I'm sorry if I'm just blowing sunshine and smoke up my own ass. But this for me is one of those moments as a, you know, it goes all the way back to my childhood to have Billy Sheehan walk up and turn and he stops and he looks at me and he goes, and he points at me and he goes, great bass player, dude. He's all, you're a great bass player. That's awesome. <laughs> and I just looked at him and my shit hits me and looks at me and I'm just like, fuck, I wish somebody was recording that. I almost <laughs> want to go, can I get this in writing? And I'm going to need you to reenact re re this right now. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and I didn't tell a lot of people that, but like that was one of those moments for me as a musician that I just go, fuck yeah, dude. And I mean. don't play anything like Billy Sheehan, and I don't want to because Billy Sheehan plays like Billy Sheehan. Right. And I don't need to be Billy Sheehan. There's already a Billy Sheehan. But when as a kid growing up and like, you know, like figure, dude, I, some, one of the first bass solos I ever learned was that. Um, like seven seven one eight whatever it is that bass solo thing he does and it's that little and i didn't learn the whole thing because it's too good for me i, I was <laughs> it, and i was a child at the time and and um and um it's that that he does that like whatever that major chord is it's just like a 
E major and he does the right hand tapping on it mm -hmm. and does the melody line and then goes to minor. And, and I learned that like when I was fuck 17 or 18, 17, maybe whatever. And, and just like, I was just like, dude, this guy, he was like the bass Eddie Van Halen. Right. And, and so anyways, it's, you know, like my 16, 17 year old self was just like, Holy fuck. Like I was just like, Billy Shea just told me I was a great bass player. He said, great. He didn't say good. He said fucking great. And God damn it. I'll take that. Yeah. yeah I was just like, it's one of those moments in life where you're like, fuck yeah. So, you know, props to Billy. He's fucking awesome. And he's a Yamaha dude and he has been forever. And I tip my hat to that fucking guy. Yeah. Amazing. Absolutely. Amazing work with winery dogs too. Oh yeah. Oh dude. He's yeah. yeah. Amazing. I mean, I, I would never want to play like him because he already plays like that. Sure, sure. It, but it's it's pretty cool if if you're I don't know if you've ever dicked around with a, a two pickup biamp kind of situation with the distortion and the and the and the low end like he, he does that. Has it a really, rig. it yeah, and, and it eats and guitar players. I bet it just eats up all the frequencies too. I bet they hate that. <laughs> he has a lot of mid range for sure, <laughs> dude. Um, so so and it's fun to play I've, I've played on some rigs i've done that before and done it. it it really lends itself especially when you put a bunch of compression on it it's really fun and it makes you want to play more notes because you can get that singing sustain and those right. harmonics and it really like it's really geared towards that type of playing so i get it i get why he does that yeah it's perfect for the winery dogs where he needs to fill more space while richie does other stuff you know Oh yeah, yeah, you totally, totally can do that. Which you know gets into the whole cheap trick, twelve string, Doug Pinnock, all that. I love that stuff too. But and it's it really you know it eats up a lot of frequencies. It's pretty cool. I mean, John Paul Jones played eight string alembic in some of the later um, Led Zeppelin stuff. I don't know if a lot of people know that, but he had an eight string alembic that he played, and it filled up a lot of frequencies, man. And you know. He played 12 string later on after Led Zeppelin. So I did not. That's a whole that. other <laughs> Q and A. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. So, uh, Kelly, the coolest fucking bass player in the rock biz. Thanks so much for being on the show, man. Um, I mean, what, what else is there to say? He's just the coolest guy. Yeah. Huge well, fan of thank you so much, Dallas. And, uh, you guys have a freaking, have a freaking good one. Have a freaking good one. We will. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. Thanks, brother. We'll see you soon. All right, guys. Take it easy, man. See ya. Hey, guys. First of all, thank you so much for listening. If you could please take a quick moment to subscribe on iTunes and leave a rating and review, your feedback seriously is really important, and it helps us keep the show alive. Check out MusiciansTalkShow.com to sign up for our mailing list. If you do, we're going to send you our main theme song and a few other surprises. Plus, you'll always be the first to know what episodes are coming up. If you want to help support the show so we can keep putting out the highest quality content possible, please follow the Support the Show link at our website and consider donating to our Patreon page. Lastly, if you have an idea for a guest or a question you want to discuss, contact us through any of the contact forms on our website, and we'll do everything we can to make it happen. Whew, all right. That was a lot, but we got through it. Thanks again, guys, and we will see you soon. Yeah.